Hi, Dave Soriano, and I'm a chemistry professor with the University of Pittsburgh's Bradford campus in Pennsylvania. One of my areas of research is the synthesis of protonoids, so-called protonoids. These were first uh, produced, synthesized, and characterized by the late biochemist professor, biochemistry professor Sidney Fox in the 1950s as part of a program to explore and understand prebiotic chemistry. And uh, the technology is such that these thermal polypeptides produced by simply heating selected amino acids up to a high enough temperature causing uh, polymerization, polyamide or synthetic uh, peptide bond formation. Um, these materials are finding use as vesicles, as uh, carriers for um, incorporation of uh, biochemical agents, along the lines, I would suppose, of liposome technology with uh, um, basically a vesicle, an empty cell, hydrophobic with a uh, drug uh, incorporated in the interior. My application is to produce selected thermal polypeptides to find out if they can be metabolized. Now, these materials, I start in the case of the amino acids with the exception of achiroglycine, I'm starting with the L enantiomers. Uh, organic chemists would call the L configuration S. During the course of heating these, to 190 degrees Celsius, racemization, a degree of racemization of the chiral carbons is expected to occur. So these materials will have incorporated the amino acid residues, but at the same time they will have a percentage of uh, D incorporated. Will they be metabolized by uh, selected microbes? Well, the starting point for the work, and we'll show you uh, what the coloration looks like as reaction is occurring. The starting point is European patent number 0642532A1, issued to Emisphere Technologies Incorporated, and the inventors were uh, Cantor and Milstein. And they were producing this, the protonoids, as... Um, medicinal carriers. The reaction is conducted in sulfalane solvent. That's uh, tetrahydrothiophene that's been oxidized with hydrogen peroxide twice to the sulfone level. This interesting material, this solvent, uh, has a boiling point way up there, like 285 Celsius, and the melting point is around 24 degrees Celsius. So a uh, hair gun will um, very readily liquefy the uh, liquid, uh, the solvent. And the reaction, reaction process calls for uh, incorporation of the amino acids in this solvent. I'm using a scale of about 75 milliliters of solvent and uh, I'm adding 30 grams or so of L-glutamate to start. These polypeptides have to have a significant portion of glutamic acid, 25-35% the minimum because that, in turn, that glut glutamate will form a, uh, a very much a solvent-like intermediate that can dissolve the additional amino acids that you add. And what I want to know is if, uh, once isolated and dialyzed, will these polypeptides be metabolized? Our first attempt is using L-glutamate, as mentioned, and after a period of time, Following example number one in the patent, a uh, percentage of glycine, an equal molar amount of glycine is added, followed by a small percentage, uh, about 5% on a molar basis compared to the glutamate and glycine, which are equal molar, of L-histidine. I'm using a small amount of histidine because when I crash this polypeptide, when the reaction is complete after three, four hours, when I crash it into distilled water, the water is about pH 6. We don't want this 
polypeptide to be soluble. It may be soluble, of course, in base with the uh, L-glutamic acid ionizing, but we don't want too much of the histidine that would interfere with the solubility characteristics. The molecular weight under these conditions is reported by the inventors to be 25 to 3500 Dalton units and uh, we will carry out after precipitation and washing we will uh, ionize, solubilize in uh, aqueous base, carry out dialysis and then freeze dry to get the residual polypeptides. In case you're interested in what they look like, here's a short video at the start. We're at 190 degrees. L-glutamic acid is beginning to dissolve at about 185, 190. And this will give you an idea of what it looks like in the initial stage. Okay, we're, Dave Soriano. I'm a chemistry professor. We're stirring it, of course, in the no silicon bath. In Western Pennsylvania, USA. What you're seeing there is a silicon oil bath up at around 185, 190 degrees Celsius. And that flask contains sulfalane solvent and a certain amount of amino acid L-glutamate, L-glutamic acid. I have a student working with me, Cassidy, Cassidy Cora, and he'll be graduating in chemistry in a few weeks. He's working with me on this project. We're making protonoids, synthetic polypeptides, and we will be, after a short period of time at this temperature, adding the second amino acid, glycine, and then we will be adding a third amino acid, a certain amount of each, L-histidine. Our objective is to make so-called protonoids, synthetic polypeptides, and uh, my colleague, Dr. Singh, a microbiologist, will be determining if these thermal polypeptides are metabolized by selected microbes. During the course of heating at 190, racemization will occur of the L-amino acids, two of the three here, glycine being a chiral. So there will be a certain percentage of the D and anti were incorporated into the chain. Molecular weights, according to a patent, European patent. Molecular weight should be two to three thousand Dalton units. So it's a rather small polypeptide, uh, a small pro, uh, polypeptide, very small protein if you want, protonoid. And I'll be determining if fiddler crafts, I'm doing chemical ecology work with them, if fiddler crafts will metabolize this material. Will they ingest it and will they metabolize it? second amino acid is going to be now added very shortly. The next video, this is after the reaction has been progressing a while. We take small aliquots out and uh, on a spatula and add it to water and what we're finding is as the reaction progresses over time the material becomes less and less soluble uh, in the water and that's one of the ways to monitor the reaction is to actually every half an hour or so take a little bit out put in a little beaker of water and see if it's becoming less and less soluble uh... it'll darken we're doing the reaction intentionally in the open atmosphere exposure to uh, oxygen and later down the road we'll do the reactions as described in the patent under a blanket of nitrogen gas but um... let's go back to that a minute Okay, how long has this been going now? It's a silicon oil bath. It's about an hour. All amino acids are in there? It's still uh, stirrable. Water is being driven out at this temperature. Later on we'll have a nitrogen sparge. Blow the uh, water vapor out that's forming. I've done these in the past the way Sidney Fox did by simply taking glutamate and other amino acids and uh, simply heating them up. Um, there's a reference here, Journal of Molecular Evolution, volume 15, 1980, page 161 to 168 by Nakashima and Fox, which we'll describe in the experimental section on page 162. 
a uh, solid phase approach. And the key is that the aspartate of glutamate will form uh, cyclic intermediates that uh, will solubilize the other residues that you select. Now, why am I picking glutamate, glycine, and histidine? Well, my colleague Dr. Singh has found that selected microbes will metabolize and grow on minerals plus uh, L-glutamate as the sole carbon diet. They will grow on uh, glycine, but interestingly enough, the ones he's looking at, or uh, the microbes he's looking at, will not metabolize histidine. They will not grow on histidine. And what he wants to find out is, if offered these polypeptides, will they grow on that? Can they break it down? Can they hydrolyze the polypeptide? And uh, would they be able to metabolize and grow on it? And the one that can't grow on histidine, it'll be interesting to see if it will indeed grow on this polypeptide by releasing hydrolyzing glutamate and glycine. The question becomes, with their protease enzymes, will these polypeptides fit into the active site considering that some of the amino acids will be now of the D configuration versus the L. Um, at the same time I'm interested in fiddler crabs and uh, I do chemical ecology work and fiddler crabs which are very active during the day and found in, in estuaries, tidal areas, uh, they live in brackish water 70-80% fresh water and the balanced salt water and they're very active during the day and in their natural habitat they're often found on a beach-like area with full exposure to sunlight. They are diurnal in terms of melanin production, pigmentation production. You can see it in their carap the carapace, the shell if you will, and uh, the legs. It's a decapod and they actually will darken during the day and lighten at night and the amino acid tyrosine is a precursor in the pathway to melanin biosynthesis. So down the road, I will be producing polypeptides enriched in tyrosine to find out, will the crabs ingest the material? I've already seen no effort to ingest isolated amino acids such as glycine. It may be too bitter to the animal, I don't know but does not seem to want to show any interest. I feed them shrimp pellets, but they don't ingest the amino acid. So I want to find out if they will ingest the polypeptide as a protein source, dietary source, and will they metabolize it. With enrichment in tyrosine, will that have an effect on the melanin expression? And we will take the water samples, actually, that they are in, living in, and uh, part of the time, and do HPLC analysis of the water, their excrement from the carapace should go into the water or be found in the water and uh, we'll do HPLC analysis to see if we're detecting any of the polypeptide having passed through the animal without being metabolized or whether it's not showing up. So these are some of the things we're doing with these uh, peptides, uh, thermal polypeptides. If you need contact information, I'm Dave Soriano associate professor of chemistry in the Department of Chem at the University of Pittsburgh Bradford in Western Pennsylvania, USA. Here is my email address. If you want to follow our research this summer of 2013 and fall, go to bamboozer.com and I have a webcam going 24-7 with a Raspberry Pi PC and just uh, look for me under d.s.soriano and you can see my fiddlegrab work. Hey, thanks for watching. Bye now.